Hello, my name is Tony. Certain films should only be seen in the medium they were intended to be seen in. Night of the Demon, Curse of the Demon in the US, but let's not dwell on that. Jacques Tony was 1957 classic should only ever be experienced in black and white. It was made in and for that mode of presentation. I say this because a while back it was something of a Hollywood craze to utilize technology to colorize some classic black and white movies. It's a Wonderful Life, Casablanca, stuff like that. Now with the rise of AI techniques, the process has become a more effortless and immediate undertaking. Well, hell with that. I wouldn't touch such heresy with the Eiffel Tower on the end of a very long barge pole. Just leave shit alone. Night of the Demon is a black and white film born to be a black and white film and doesn't work any other way. As we go, I'll touch on why this is. Meanwhile, it's an updated retelling of the M.R. James short story Cast in the Runes. It was filmed twice more later, first in 1968 as an episode of the ITV anthology show Mystery and Imagination, no complete copies of which are thought to exist anymore, although there is a very poor jerky and murky home recorded version on YouTube. ITV filmed it again in 1979 as the teleplay Cast in the Runes, part of its ITV Playhouse series. This one is available on DVD from Network. Night of the Demon is the best screen version of the story, even if it doesn't adhere very closely to it, and one of the very best horror fantasy movies ever made, in spite of some unfortunate, unnecessary and wholly avoidable flaws, without which it would have been borderline perfection. Kicks off at night with Professor Harrington Morris Denham arriving unannounced at the palatial country retreat of Dr. Julian Carswell, Niall McGuinness, who lives with his dotty mother, Athene Sailor. Carswell is the head honcho of a satanic cult and something of an Aleister Crowley figure. Harrington was about to expose Carswell as a charlatan at an international convention when Carswell placed a curse on him via a slip of runic parchment. Harrington now believes the curse to be real and begs Carswell to rescind it. On hearing that the parchment was destroyed by fire, the Satanist glances at the clock and his expression clearly says, too late chum, you're fucked. However, he placates Harrington by telling him he will do all that he can to help. When Harrington gets home, he sees a huge demonic figure approaching him through the trees. In a panic, he reverses his car into a wooden pole, bringing the power lines down and getting electrocuted. Yep, fried to crispy critters. But do not despair. Our protagonist is Dr. John Holden, Dana Andrews, an American psychologist, specialist subject, the occult and its relation to the cultural effect on religious ideology and mental health or something. He's flying to the UK to meet with Harrington and investigate Carswell before the conference. It would seem a member of Carswell's cult, a rural farmer, Rand Hobart, Brian Wilde, has been accused of murder and committed to a secure mental institution. So there's not only a whiff of brimstone in the air, but one of scandal, and cow shit, probably. On the flight, trying to get some sleep, Holden is continuously disturbed by the lovely young lady seated behind him. If such a woman disturbed me, I'd only be too happy to be disturbed. As it is, I have to content myself with being naturally disturbed in the absence of anything gorgeous to address. To. She's Joanna Harrington, Peggy Cummings, Professor Harrington's niece, but he doesn't know that yet. Well, how could he? They haven't been formally introduced. Meeting with Harrington's colleagues in London, Professor O'Brien, Liam Redmond, and Professor Kumar, Peter Elliott, Holden is surprised to learn of Harrington's death. He is completely closed off to the suggestion of supernatural forces at work, though. He's a dogged pragmatist and realist with a no-nonsense attitude, which begs the question, why choose psychology as a career? When he meets up with Joanna, Anna at Harrington's funeral, she shows him her uncle's diary in which she has written about the curse and how he came to believe it to be real, how Carswell passed him a runic parchment. Holden will have none of it. I'm not having that, he says. Well, he doesn't, but that's the gist. He is the ultimate sceptic. Approached by Carswell twice, once by phone and again in the reading room of the British Museum, he declines to heed his advice to drop his inquiries and mind his own business. Carswell slips a piece of parchment into one of Holden's flies. Sorry, typo, files, and invites him to his place to view an ancient runic text in his possession. When he and Joanna take up the invitation, they find Carswell performing a magic show for local children as part of his annual Halloween garden party. He tries to convince 
Prince Holden of his power by conjuring up a ferocious storm, but our boy will still have none of it. He then informs him that he only has three days to live. See how you get on with that, Holden. The rest of the film is taken up with unsettling and insidious events in which Holden experiences perceptual disturbances and creeping unease, finds the parchment in his papers, and learns from Rand Hobart just before he takes a nosedive out of a window to his death that the only way to lift the curse is to pass the parchment back to the original source. With his beliefs increasingly challenged by inexplicable events, rationalising like a motherfucker and time running out, just how will he avoid death by demon and bring Carswell down? Black and white then, and why it should remain black and white and only ever be seen in black and white. A combination of Edward Scaife's pristine cinematography and Tornua's masterful talent for scene composition make this one of the most vivid and atmospheric of films. Faced with the most restricted of colour palettes, their use of light and shade in creating mood, depth of feeling and perspective, and suggesting hidden menace and threat in the shadows is almost fucking peerless. Even the daytime scenes, such as Holden's visit to Stonehenge, where he realises the same runes carved into the stone monolith appear in Carswell's ancient book are fabulously creepy and evocative. And I have to say that the crisp, clean Blu-ray print I recently watched from a company called Indicator is an eyeball tickler of the highest order. This is host to so many standout moments that grip and stick like Gorilla Glue on a toilet seat. Very hard to shake off. I've already mentioned his visit to Stonehenge. Preceding it is another visit to Rand Hobart's farm, where his extended family of grim-faced yokel folk give Holden the coldest of welcomes. Their superstitious people, still enthralled to the old gods and pre-Christian beliefs, ley lines probably running through all facets of their existence, vibrating like tuning forks right up their pastures. The ruling matriarch signs a release paper so that Holden can interview her son, even though she's clearly written him off as doomed. The whole scene bristles with eerie implied threat and palpable unease. The storm Carswell conjures up throws everyone but him into disarray. It rages and wrecks havoc, but he remains composed, smiling faintly and knowingly throughout, comfortable in his understanding of the power he can tap into and control. I didn't know you had cyclones in England, Holden tells him. We don't, he deadpans. Hobart's interrogation under hypnosis is another that burrows under the skin. For a stone-cold sceptic, Holden certainly becomes very animated and eager to know just how to get rid of the curse he doesn't believe in. Hobart reveals he handed his parchment back to the guy who gave it to him, and now stands accused of that man's murder. When Holden shows him his own piece of parchment, Hobart, believing he's trying to pass it on to him, throws himself through a window to splatter ingloriously below. The famous seance scene is a source of eccentric light relief, but only in part. Carswell's mother invites Holden and Joanna to the home of medium Mr. Meek, Reginald Beckwith, and his wife, Rosamond Greenwood. To help Meek enter a trance, the two women, without warning, belt out old English pastoral song Cherry Ripe at the top of their lungs with crazy comic gusto. Like it. First time you see it, it's a downright shock to the system. You don't know whether you're expected to laugh or be unnerved or both. Things turn a few shades darker when Meek speaks with Professor Harrington's voice. The famous lines, it's in the trees, it's coming. It's in the trees, it's coming was sampled by Kate Bush for inclusion on her 1985 track Hounds of Love. She's no relation, by the way, so it's okay I fancied her. The lead-up to the finale is a tension-packed event, with Holden and Joanna confronting Carswell in the compartment of a stationary train, and Holden trying all ways to hand the parchment back. Time is running out, and Carswell has called in the police to remove Holden, who he claims has been harassing him. At the last moment, Holden hands Carswell his coat, and realisation dawns. The parchment is in the coat pocket. As a gust of wind snatches it out of his hand, Carswell pursues it down the railway line. When he gets to it, it bursts into flames. Oh dear, what's this I see head in my way? Shit. Dana Andrews is in it because he's American. Par for the course, wanna sell it in the States, get an American in it. He's not an inspired choice by any means, but he acquits himself well enough as a close-minded academic who believes that curses only work because the victim believes they do and therefore succumbs. The power of suggestion, all in the mind. What's your excuse then? He delivers a capable take on a man whose conviction is gradually chipped away and his resolve shaken, concluding, in the end, it's probably best not to know for certain. 
Peggy Cummings is sexy and forthright as Joanna, far more open-minded and less judgmental than Holden, proving once again that strong, resilient female movie characters were around long before people started complaining that they weren't. Best performance on show, though, is Niall McGuinness as Carswell. It's a masterful portrayal of urbane evil, a smooth as silk interpretation of cultured corruption and guile. He trims the ham close to the bone, wisely avoiding lapsing into caricature, keeping it real. What helps in adding nuance is Carswell's realisation that despite his extreme confidence in his abilities, he knows dark forces are tricky buggers to control, and there's always a price to be paid by someone, so occasional glimmers of self-awareness are allowed to show through his facade. His anxieties peak in the end when it becomes clear that Holden has figured out just how the curse works. McGuinness gives a career best performance. His Carswell is one of the all-time great screen villains. So what goes wrong with it? I could cite Dana Andrews' fight with a cat that morphs into a stuffed leopard as a likely culprit. He's broken into Shea Carswell to seek out the ancient runic text that Carswell has translated. He is attacked by a house cat that transforms into a jungle cat, only it's clearly a large cuddly toy he's being savaged by. Yet I'm prepared to let that one go, because it mostly happens in shadow and the editing is tight enough to give it just the right side of total embarrassment. No, what's wrong with it is this. Tournier had a vision of a purely psychological film, where the truth of events was kept ambiguous. Is it all coincidental, auto-suggestion, hypnosis, instinctive primitive superstition, or are there really satanic forces at work? His idea was to suggest, infer, but maintain ambivalence throughout. Could be this, or could be that. In effect, toying with audience beliefs and perceptions, so that in the end they fall into one of three camps. Yes, no, dunno. That decision was taken out of his hands by producing as Hal Chester and Frank Bevis. They were insistent on showing the demon at the beginning and again at the end of the film. It is first seen lumbering through the trees to kill Harrington, then on the railway line demolishing Carswell. I suppose for the time the model used might have looked okay, but soon it looked pretty fucking bad. It damages a work of art to my mind and pisses away any shot at ambiguity by insisting that the black magic Satanist shit is all real from the outset, which additionally leads to a dilution of the tension to new was so adept at crafting into his work, and that is a criminal shame. Still, when I was a kid and largely stupid like most kids are, I liked the inclusion of the demon. As an adult, I'd like it a whole lot more if it had been completely exercised. Screenwriter Charles Bennett was also angry at changes made to the script by an uncredited Cy Enfield, who was drafted in by Chester. Chester felt the screenplay was too British. Bennett, a trifle miffed at this old sprout, said in an interview, If Chester walked up my driveway right now, I'd shoot him dead. I sense some antagonism here. I have a talent for picking up on such things. But don't let any of that put you off. Night of the Demon is a milestone work from a legendary director and the forerunner of a lot of devil and witchcraft thrillers from further down the line. Scorsese listed as one of his favourite movies. A book on demonology in the Tom Hanks film The Burbs is accredited to one Julian Carswell. Peggy Cummings, Sunbeam Alpine Mark I sports car has a number plate ending in 666. Now there's an omen. And somehow the image of the demon became iconic in certain circles. What circles? I think you know. Whatever, largely it's incredible stuff of incredible quality. Oh what a night indeed. Thank you as always for your time and attention. Do whatever you want to do. Hit like, don't like, comment, subscribe, be a patron of my Patreon thing. Make a financial contribution via the thanks button. Next, it's back to the 60s via the late 70s. Clear as a piss pot full of mud. You'll soon see what I'm talking about. And who. Later, pilgrims.